This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Operations Management. Operations Management, think of the name, it's how you manage your operations, uh, which is basically getting raw materials in, processing raw materials, and then shifting out, selling the final products. So it's procurement and purchasing, receipt of the raw material, warehousing it, unless you're going to adjust in time sort of basis, issuing the material as needed uh, to the production lines, manufacturing the product, warehousing the final product, uh, unless it's going directly and immediately to the customers, as it might do in uh, some organizations, receiving orders, dispatching goods, uh, is, is all part of carrying on, if you like, the essence of the business. Now, everything that goes, goes into the business, I mean, a, a useful model is something called a value chain, uh, which was uh, uh, in, invented by somebody called Michael Porter. And what uh, we have in the value chain, it's not, I've got a couple in which aren't on, on this slide here, Basically, what Porter drew up were all the activities carried on by a business. So, you what are called primary activities here, which are, are almost like direct cost type activities. They are the really important things going on. Inbound logistics, that is the physical ob obtaining of raw materials. Operations, the manufacturing part. Outbound logistics, which is how the goods get to your customers. Uh, there is marketing and sales, uh, which is how you find your customers, how you get the orders. There is service, uh, and service is really uh, anything which is in addition to the main sales event. So service could be repairs and maintenance, it could be service contracts, it could be training, it could be installation. Uh, and very often service uh, produces as much profit almost as the main activities. Then you have these support or secondary activities uh, across the top. So we have firm infrastructure. Think of that as the head office, maybe the accounting department and uh, the, the like. Uh, and, and this is going to serve as all of these uh, primary activities down here. Technology development. Technology development is uh, basically research and development and you can improve how you carry on these activities and you can maybe improve the products themselves through technology uh, uh, development. Uh, you've got HR. HR should be in here. Human resources. So human resources, uh, how you recruit, let's say, people in manufacturing, how you train them, uh, how you appraise them, how you keep the good people, how you decide to promote them, and, and so on. Human resource is a very, very critical area of operations management, uh, because whereas a, a machine that you might buy to manufacture goods is going to be there tomorrow, next week, next year probably, uh, the person working in the machine could decide to go home tonight and never come back. Uh, they could just resign, they could move to a competitor and so on. Uh, so managing human resources is actually very difficult. And finally, we have what's in here called procurement. And procurement really is, is placing orders. Uh, Porter divided up in by logistics, which is getting the goods, and uh, procurement, which is placing orders for the, the, the raw materials. But pr procurement could be buying raw materials themselves, but it could also, as, as, as within it, the procurement of machinery, the procurement of premises, the procurement of, procurement of you know, all the non-current assets and so on have to be bought in some way as well. So having a, 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 an expert kind of buying department uh, can be important. Now what Porter said was, each of these activities will have a cost. Uh, and let's say uh, that the cost of all of the activities uh, is, is, let's say, uh, 10 million. And 
and you carry on this and if you're going to be making your goods and so on let's say the revenue get is 15 million so you've got a profit in there of 5 million and that's what this is here this this red line at the uh, uh, the start that's your profit I said all of these activities are there are, are being organized to, to generate you a profit and Porter said isn't it really rather magical that by you spending 10 million other people called customers come and give you 15 million and he says why don't they do it themselves why don't they save 5 million by simply you know doing what you're doing he says it must be because you're doing something which either they can't do or they don't want to do uh, maybe they can't do it because they're due to the expertise maybe they can't do it because your operations here even though it's only a cost of 10 million is actually quite large and they only want five percent of your output uh, and they couldn't possibly operate uh, with the economy of scale at five percent of your size so so your scale is doing something for them they can't do them themselves uh, and maybe what they pay you is actually less even with your profit in it what they pay you is actually less than what it would cost them to do it themselves or maybe they don't want to do it maybe they think uh, there's too much risk in doing what you do and i would rather outsource that to someone else who shoulders the risk but Porter says you must know yourself you must understand what gives you the right to make profit and profit is value added why by doing your stuff costing 10 million is value added that other people are going to spend 15 million on it he says so, so know yourself know what it is that your customers treasure about you so if it's low cost per unit make sure you concentrate on it if it's fantastic quality that they're paying for make sure you you you, you concentrate on always producing goods of the finest quality uh, if it's great flexibility you're going to get goods to them really really quickly uh, that's what they're paying for that sort of convenient then for goodness sake you know don't don't kill the, the goose that lays the golden egg there make sure that all of your activities are arranged if you like uh, to maximize the uh, you know the the ability to give the customers what they want this is what you need to do in your operations management really and you'll see that you know, there's a certain choice within this for example in outbound logistics here how do we get goods to people well one way is you ask people to come to you to pick it up at your warehouse or you ask people to go to a shop and pick it up or maybe what you do is you distribute it to people so so you post it or you you, you send it by a, a logistics company in some way as, as amazon does there, there's often choice as to how these work and you have to say well uh, you know what, what would our customers want what would they value doing uh, and, and that's what you have to try to deliver basically uh, so in our operations there is a, a choice do we do it ourselves or do we outsource quite a lot of the operations do the customers care and if they don't care well we may as well do whichever is cheaper provided the quality is okay now the supply chain uh, is uh, basically how you get uh, raw materials in do something with it and, and get it out to the customer so what we have in in here uh, basically this is your supplier and this is your procurement department and you are going to collaborate through your procurement department with your supplier uh, you're going to look at different suppliers you're going to look at the the prices the quality the delivery times and so on you have to decide is it going to be several suppliers or one supplier and so on you're going to get the best supply end if you like to your uh, supply chain and then uh, out here you have this is your customer your customer uh, they're buying so, so their procurement department if it's another company 
will be liaising here with basically your, your kind of sales department, your sales and distribution department here. So they will be saying, they will be negotiating, are you going to send us the goods? Uh, are we going to come for them? These people, these customers are going to decide, do we want just to buy from you? Or are we going to buy from a number of different suppliers, maybe to play one off against the other and, and so on? So uh, the, the upstream, downstream uh, here, think of the goods as flowing like this. This is a raw material. Going out here, this is your finished goods. Think of it almost as a, as a kind of river going through here, carrying the goods through. Upstream is a supply chain before the goods get to you, before the raw material gets to you. Downstream uh, is uh, really a supply chain after the products leave your warehouse, get to the first buyer, and then maybe the subsequent buyers, and so on. Everyone within this chain uh, has to be capable of making a profit. Uh, so the overall profit if you made, made by the product, if you like, has to cover all the components within the supply chain. There are two uh, methods of doing this. The push model is where you make goods and you put them in inventory and then you supply out of inventory. Uh, the pull model, uh, which really requires much probably higher IT involvement, is where you get a, a an order coming in from the customer and based on that order you plan your production. Based on your production plans you base your purchasing uh, orders that are going to be sent out to your suppliers. This, uh, in a way, has to work like clockwork. This is really the just-in-time inventory control. So it is the order you get from your supplier pulls the production, pulls the raw materials into your business. IT doesn't have to be as good in the pull model, or bigger in the push model, because you make for inventory. Uh, and then when the customer says, send me a thousand of these, you kind of maybe just take them out of inventory. It doesn't have to work quite as like clockwork as does the pool model. The advantage of the pool model is lower inventory costs, lower risks to inventory. You're not carrying any inventory and probably greater flexibility. What tended to happen in the push model is you say, right, uh, this month, I'm going to make 10,000 units of this type. And you set up a production line. And if a sub customer came along and said, can you make 500 of a different product? You'd be saying, no, I'm kind of stuck at making this product for this month. Whereas the pool model requires great flexibility in, in processing uh, and, and you know, automated machinery and so on that can quickly switch from one product to another. Uh, supply chains and pathways. Uh, easy enough, this is a, another third party logistics company up here. Just illustrating uh, all the different patterns that you can have uh, here. Uh, so, this is us here. We can be buying directly from a supplier. That supplier may be themselves buying from somewhere else. We can buy it in directly. It can come through a logistics company uh, like that. Our function might be design, not actually manufacturing. So what we do is we coordinate a supplier here to deliver directly to the uh, customer without it coming close to us. We have a different sort of a role in there, which is not manufacturing at all. It is design uh, and, and acting as the, uh, the liaison, if you like, uh, uh, between the customer and the manufacturer. Again, it could go through a, a third-party character a, a carrier uh, down here, and then that customer could be, you know, sending it to another customer, another customer, until it ultimately gets to the end consumer. So that's just illustrating how kind of complex that can be. For uh, to give an example, here we have a, 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 a an orange juice company. Here we have label producers. We have bottles coming in, we have bottlers, we have a juicing plant, we have uh, the people growing the oranges there. Uh, it, it, it's going to be 
marketed, it goes out to supermarkets, wholesalers, and then to retailers, restaurants, airlines, and so on, uh, uh, hospitals perhaps, and so on. Very, very complex, both in the input stage, or the oranges, the juice, the bottles, the labels, maybe additives if there are any there, producing the stuff, bottling the stuff, labeling the stuff, and then distributing it to individual consumers, mass consumers, at home, abroad, and so on. Uh, it takes really quite a lot of organization and research to get this working well and reliably. A supply uh, portfolio means analyzing your suppliers uh, really to see um, how should we manage them, which are the ones perhaps we have to be really careful about. Uh, not all supplies or raw materials will give us equal bother or are of equal importance. Uh, and this supply portfolio makes some suggestions about what we should be doing really. Uh, so what we've got in uh, uh, here is the profit impact of the supply and the supply difficulty. It's all it's all explained in your notes. Okay. So for example, you take something which is low profit impact and easy to get. So that is stationary. For example, it's of little consequence to us in many ways. It's going to be loads of suppliers loads of people competing in price. It's Stationery is not going to be a big thing anyway for most of us. Don't spend an awful lot of resource choosing your stationary suppliers. It might You might think you're doing valuable work, uh, but actually you're probably not. This one here, where there's low profit uh, impact, but high supply difficulty, Here's where we, we just have to be a little bit uh, 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 careful. It's, it's of low profit impact, so we might become a little bit careless about it, not quite give it the attention it needs. But if these supplies were to uh, dry up, and they might because supply difficulty is high, there might only be one supplier or there might be a supplier in a you know remote part of the world where you know, hurricanes and goodness knows what uh, intervene from time to time, uh, then we are going to be seriously embarrassed. It's not whilst we're getting the supplies, it hasn't got a big impact on uh, the profit. But if we're not going to get these these supplies, it could have a you know a big stopper if you like on making anything at all. Uh, what we maybe need to do there is to think well. Maybe build in a buffer. Maybe make sure if if supply is a bit a bit iffy. Uh, maybe we should instead of going to just in time, maybe we should have a, a warehouse full of these supplies, so that if there is a a, a problem, uh, we we can keep going. Now an example of that was seen. I don't remember if you remember, but about oh fifteen years ago from from now, uh, an Icelandic volcano began spewing smoke into the air uh, and particles of dust uh, and these were dangerous to aircraft jet engines and it meant all over Europe for about one to two weeks uh, airlines couldn't fly and this meant that uh, companies that were relying in the UK say for components being flown in so a company like Toyota just in time type inventory would fly in components, you know, light ones, but we'd be flying them in, let's say, from Japan, relatively small components, uh, uh, but they couldn't get these components in and they very quickly ran out of components. And for it, almost the, you know, the, the want of a nail, the war was lost uh, because they couldn't complete the cars without these relatively trivial components. Over here, uh, where it is leverage, high profit impact, low supply difficulty, well, let's work at it. You know, if it's low supply difficulty, it implies there are many suppliers we could play one off against the other, and we could get a really good deal that could have a big impact on our profit. 
And here we have to be really careful indeed. It's hard to get the goods. It's got a high impact on profit. Here's where our procurement managers will really be thinking of, you know, putting an awful lot of effort to make sure our supplies are suitable. Main choices in supply pathways, we've seen a lot of this in the diagrams uh, here. Who transports the goods in? Us or them, logistics company. What delivery pathways are best? For example, should it be by air or road or rail or sea? Who stores the goods? Uh, this is interesting uh, when you get to, to certain kind of medical goods or food goods. Uh, because you have to be able to guarantee that the goods stay, let's say, below five degrees centigrade. Uh, if, if, you know, can we guarantee this chain going on there? Who's going to be capable of, of guaranteeing the goods have never risen above this critical temperature? Can the logistics company do that? If we get it into a warehouse, is that the safest place to do it? Which, uh, manufacturing, packaging, label, kit, kitting, uh, boxing up, if you like, are going to be carried out by ourselves and which by uh, other parties. Uh, uh, so mobile phones, for example, are typically brought into the UK in a very generic form and then in the UK they'd use a logistics company to say, well this one is going to be suitable for the Vodafone network, this is going to be suitable for, you know, the, the um, 3e network or whatever it is there and and they they that is done not by the manufacturer not by samsung it's done by a logistics company in the uk that's that's the idea of kitting who's going to make sure that we have the you know the right plugs and sockets and so on uh the the, the right language of uh, instructions put in with the uh, components suitable for the country who is responsible for uh, uh, quality assurance uh, and the proper handling of the goods? And again, I go back to saying who is going to be able to guarantee this food has never been above five degrees centigrade, uh, this has not been damaged in transit and, 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 and so on. Somebody has to take that sort of uh, uh, responsibility. How should returns be handled? Uh, uh, how fast and responsible should deliveries be? Should we get somebody who can guarantee delivery within a day? Or will the customer thinking, you know, we have to stay friends with our customers. They have to be willing to pay a good price. And, and maybe that's because they are guaranteed getting the goods tomorrow. So a lot of uh, kind of questions to be looking at there in terms of the choices in the uh, supply chain.